George, I've been speaking to mathematicians, and there's really great debate whether mathematics is invented or discovered. And it's more than a philosophical debate, if you will, because it really bespeaks to what is reality? Is there some kind of other reality beyond that which we see in the physical world? From the standpoint of the embodied mind, which you have uh, elucidated, uh, how, how does mathematics fit? Math mathematics is not either invented or discovered. The dichotomy is false. Uh, it's like the false dichotomy between being a realist and a relativist. If, if, you're if the mind is embodied, you're connected to the world, you're interacting with it, you don't have a direct understanding of it, but you're, you, evolve, you, you evolved to fit the world well, to function well in it. And the same is true with mathematics. We have in our brains the ability to, do, uh, uh, to be able to tell one from two, from three, from four, right? And there's a part of our brain that does that, very simply. We are able, uh, as infants, to be able to do what's called baby arithmetic, right? You, you have a child that's a few days old. It's sitting there happily sucking on a bottle. Uh, you have somebody uh, checking where its eye movements goes. You take a stage. It goes up. You, there's a puppet on there. Then the stage goes down. The mother puts another puppet on. It goes up. There are two puppets. Baby's happy. If it goes up and there are three puppets. The baby sucks like mad and stares, right? The baby from birth can tell one and one is two, very simply. There's stuff in the mind for very, very simple arithmetic, not in terms of numbers or calculation or you know things like that, but there's basic arithmetic there. Now, that capacity gets extended via the rest of the mind and brain, and it gets extended very largely via metaphor. For example, uh, when a child is very young, there's a stage in which children are playing with containers. They're putting things in and taking them out and getting into stuff and, you know, uh, you know constantly putting things, uh, finding places to hide stuff and putting them in and taking them out. There's a, a good month or two when babies are just doing that. And what they're doing, as they do that, they can tell how many things are going in and how many things are coming out. They're constructing a metaphor for arithmetic unconsciously, automatically, their brains are doing this, in which um, numbers uh, have to do with collections of objects. And that, um, you know, the, the, the size of a collection is the size of a number. That's one of our major metaphors for arithmetic. There's another, they, when they take steps or they move, there's two steps, three steps, etc. They are what are called subitizing, that is, they are uh, being able to tell one and one is two and so on, very simply. And then they have a notion of number as being steps in space, where the place you start is your zero and you mm -hmm. continue. Uh, there, are, there are four, I won't go through all of them, basic uh, metaphors for arithmetic that work like that, and they all have pretty much the same entailments. Metaphors are things you reason in terms with, in terms of, and, and you're in, you have the same entailments for basic arithmetic. But then there are other things in arithmetic that don't come out of that, like have you ever wondered why minus one times minus one is plus one, right? Well, there's a cognitive reason for this, and it does not come out of those metaphors. What does come out of the metaphor of being able to see uh, numbers as points on a line in space is that you can go backwards the other way, and that gives you negative numbers. Now, when you think about it and you visualize that, you can do mental rotations. We know from Roger Shepard's experiments, we do mental rotations. And you can rotate 180 degrees and get the positive numbers going times the negative numbers. So that, you know, if you do that, rotation by 180 degrees is multiplication by minus one. You do it twice okay. and you get back to plus one. Mental rotation added to those metaphors gives you minus one times minus one is plus one. And then that ultimately leads to the imaginary numbers because when you do i times the square root of minus 1 times the square root of minus 1, it's 90 mm -hmm. degrees and 90 degrees. And that's why in imaginary arithmetic, uh, when you multiply by i, the square root of minus 1, it's a rotation of 90 degrees. Okay? It's very simple stuff coming out of the nature of the brain and the mind and the way the mind works. This is something that's built into our brains and it's a natural capacity, 
But it's also, once you set up those metaphors, they have entailments. They can be, metaphors can be entirely precise, and mathematics must be precise. Uh, it can be regular, and we think regularly in terms of them. And um, you can define exactly what's going on in terms of a system that is grounded in the body, where the concepts are clear from the way they're grounded, and where the metaphors give entailments. And it turns out that once you ground them, you can then discover what the entailments are. So what mathematicians do once they set up a branch of mathematics, they are discovering that. Now, metaphors are crucial in setting up branches of mathematics. Think, for example, of the number line. Now, in that, there you have a metaphor. Numbers are points on a line. They don't have to be points on a line. They could just be numbers. In set theory, numbers are sets of a certain kind. Zero is the empty set, one is the set containing the empty set, and so on. That's a metaphor. It's not out there in the world. But once you do that, you can discover the properties of that metaphor, and you get a whole branch of mathematics. And this is true in general uh, for all branches of mathematics. Take the issue of infinity, a crucial idea. How do you get the infinite set of numbers? just of, of integers, for example. It goes on and on and on. Well, we have two different concepts of infinity. There's one that doesn't end, no end, that's infinity. It goes on and on and on. But that's not the one that's in traditional mathematics, though there is an unconventional form of mathematics that uses that. In traditional mathematics, there is a complete set of all the numbers, even if, though they don't end. How is that possible? The answer is metaphor, and what's interesting about it is that Rafael Nunez and I discovered that there is one metaphor for what we call actual infinity in all branches of mathematics. And it applies differently in different branches, but it gives the answer, for example, to uh, uh, why you can have infinite numbers. It gives ad uh, answers to, for example, how calculus works. And, you know, it's the same metaphor for infinity that's involved in understanding calculus. And uh, it, then you can say, well, how do you do this? How is it possible to understand this? And the answer is very interesting, and it comes out of cognitive science and linguistics. We have discovered in uh, linguistics and in the study of neural computation uh, that the idea of aspect in linguistics, which is the structure of events, uh, has to do with um, the, a certain kind of neural structure that allows you to sequence events as wholes and to have a starting position, a central part, an ending position, and so on. Very, in every language, you distinguish between concepts that have an end point, like I walked a mile, or I jumped when you finish when you come down, versus I breathed, where you keep going on and on. Uh, one is completed, the other is incompleted. Right Now, what happens with infinity that goes on and on and on is it's incomplete. Actual mm -hmm. infinity metaphorically understands that in terms of completed aspect, like an, an action that has an endpoint where it goes on and on and on, but it imposes the endpoint metaphorically. Mm -hmm. And when you formulate that precisely, and one thing that we do in the theory of metaphor is give precise, mathematically precise formulations of these metaphors, you can show that what actual infinity is. And then you can show it's something that can apply not only in arithmetic, but it can apply in geometry. That is, for example, what is a real number? What is pi? Well, you go from 3.1, 3.14, 3.145, et etc., until you get the infinite expansion of pi. Well, that's the same metaphor going to infinity. Uh, the same thing happens in other branches of mathematics, as we show in our book, uh, that mathematics is, me is metaphorical, but when you set up a new branch of mathematics, what you're doing is putting together metaphors from other branches of mathematics. Let's say I grant everything that you say. There still was a time that is 99.999, etc., cetera, of, 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 of universal history, where there were no minds, where there were no brains around, that the physical world worked, and that physical world seems to be described by mathematics. So you, you, one is still confronted with the question that even as we apprehend mathematics through metaphor, 
assuming I grant everything you say, there is still a, a mathematics in the world, even if human beings never existed or if brains never existed. It's not in the world. The world is as it is. Uh, let's take a very simple case. Uh, take a spiral nebula, okay? And you can show that there are logarithmic spirals in nature. Quote, that's the way they put it. As if the spiral, the mathematical formula, were out there in nature. But it turns out, when you understand what's going on in such a nebula, it's, it's pretty straightforward. What you have is a constant rotation, and you have an explosion that goes outward. And when you put those two together, when you take the metaphors for understanding rotations and the cognitive mechanisms for that, and the cognitive mechanisms for understanding it going outward, and you take the mathematics of those two, it's a logarithmic spiral. You can show exactly why that is. The logarithmic spiral is not in the nebula. It's in your understanding of the nebula. The marvelous thing about mathematics is that we can create mathematics with our brains that fit phenomena in the world remarkably. It is not a miracle that that's the case because we ha are, have the capacity to see and understand the world to, to categorize it in terms of what our brains do, and then we can create a mathematics out of that in a systematic way using what our brains allow us. It is not out there in the world. You know, the, uh, the flowers may fit certain kinds of series, uh, but the series are not in the flowers. 